Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic, and it looks like we're, we're going to see the light at the end of the tunnel here. But everybody's been so enthusiastic about these webinars, and I just have some amazing guests. So I'm just going to keep rolling with about three a week, and um, we're already lining up all our guests for May. So stay tuned and just remember that if you subscribe to the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel, you will receive a notice every time I post another webinar in case you weren't able to make it live. This is number 199, believe it or not. Um, in a little over a year, actually, I started in March, so that's pretty amazing. And Friday will be my 200th, and I'll be talking about how to use Surefoot in daily routines. because so I think that's a question that a lot of people have. Um, but today for 199, I have one of my favorite people as my guest. I've been wanting Andy to come on the webinar for as long as since I started. Um, and it's taken a while to get the technology sorted out, but we finally achieved that yesterday. And I am so I'm just so pleased I could help you with that. Yeah. Lady. <laughs> so let me introduce you to Andy Foster, uh, someone I've known for almost 30 years. Welcome, Andy. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Wayne. 30 years. I know, you know 1992. You, you get sort of uh, less than half of that for murder in England. <laughs> really do. I mean, not in your country, because you get like 99 life sentences, don't you? So, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't know. We haven't murdered each other yet, which is a good thing. <laughs> so, um, I don't quite and, not have. Yeah. So, Andy, you know, I mean, I've known you for a long time, but um, this is your first introduction to my audience. So how did you get sat started in the saddle making business? That is a really almost a boring um, answer for that one. Um, because when I was at school, I tended to excel in the um, practical, so metalwork, woodwork, that sort of thing. Um, and I sort of came first in all the exams for that. But when I left school, I didn't really want to be a carpenter. So I looked for something that I did want to do. And I wanted to work in leather. And in leather, you had a choice of all the leather goods, which are fancy leather goods, which were sort of the mediocre stuff or top of the tree at the time and probably still is, is saddle making. And so that's what I went for. So, so in, in the UK, the school system is different. Like you actually kind of have an idea of what kind of career you're going to do in what we would call high school, right? They kind of test you and kind of figure out what you're best at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And then, so did, so when did you, like, how old were you when you started making saddles, when you went to work for a saddle making company? 16. Oh, wow. <laughs> and who did you work for back then? <laughs> we won't say how long ago that was, okay? Uh -oh, you've frozen. Andy, you've frozen, don't you? But you have, you, uh, you've frozen thing. I worked for, I, I had an apprenticeship with a, an old English firm called Aldonian uh, of Warsaw. Um, and with Aldonian, uh, I did a long apprenticeship, but the only thing was that you got a, a real handle on the tools, but you didn't know anything about horses or riders because everything was made from patterns on the wall and they supplied big retail shops. So I from remember that Aldonian, that, that brand's not in, it's not in production anymore, right? Is it still around? No, it's not. Yeah. Mm -mm. That dates me too. It, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, they're a great company and they had a really good reputation, but in the, especially back then in the late sixties, early seventies, um, actually fitting a horse wasn't even in the equation. Um, people went to tack shops and bought a saddle um, and the fitting of them really had sort of lost. Uh, it's a little bit, I think that that time um, in saddle making, was a little bit like 60s architecture. It went really wrong <laughs> and it went bad. So um, they would sell saddles, um, make saddles and sell them 12 at a time to retail shops. Um, and then any problems that occurred were lost because they'd gone all over um, and they sold all over the world. Right, because so, I remember that brand here in the United States. So, yeah. so basically when you went to work for them, you basically took a pattern off the wall and built a saddle to a pattern that had never yeah. really been measured to a horse. Yes, yes. That, I mean, it, sounds, <laughs> it, it, it sounds really stupid now when you think about it, but that's just the way it had gone. That's just how saddle making had gone. Um, 
and people didn't fit horses at that point in time. Um, it was uh, it was a, a sort of a, a barren area in, in saddle fit. And so when I worked for Aldoni and I worked for them for about seven years, um, after that, um, I wanted to sort of move on from that because I could see what I needed to do and I wanted to get out and do it. Um, and so from that point, I ditched around for a couple of years uh, with somebody else that that didn't work out. And then in the early 80s is when I started my company. Um, and then I, from there, I worked with riders and horses. And so every saddle that I fitted from then till now has been fitted bespoke. Bespoke on a one -to -one. meaning that individual. Yeah, I mean, the, the word custom, to be honest, I don't like the word custom because that means you could have, um, some people would have a, a bit of a longer flap or, uh, you know, a bit of a shorter tree, whatever. And they sort of call that custom, but, um, if you, you'll see in a minute when we get into it, but actually fitting a horse, there's three things always in the equation, and that's the saddle, the horse, and the rider. And so um, all of those three things come into play and they interact with each other. And the thing about it is that if you have a saddle that um, fits a horse, but doesn't fit the rider, then you're in trouble because it equally then doesn't fit the horse. Right. And I'll try and explain that in a minute when we start drawing pictures. Right. And, you know, I know that from the my job of teaching riding that you said it once to me when you watch me teach, you said that I spend most of my time teaching riders how to ride around their saddle. That is very true. You see, most people, um, if you th if you think about it, we're all we're all guilty of it. You get muscle memory. So if you have something that's slightly wrong, you get used to it. Um, and the thing is that then when you are put right, you feel wrong in the first instance. Um, so it's, it's easy and there's so many components to a saddle that mean so much for that individual and their horse that any one of those components that isn't addressed at the time of the fitting can destroy the other components that are addressed. So if you go and have a saddle, you get a saddle and you try it on your horse and a lot of people, the way they test if a saddle fits or not is does it rock or doesn't it rock, you know, um, and sometimes it can be that uh, simplistic to somebody, but there is an awful lot more to it than that, obviously. Right. We're going to dive into a bunch of that today. Um, mm -hmm. at it. So you started your own saddle making company. And I, I remember that there was a while where you had quite a big company and a number of people working for you. And then mad cow disease came along mm -hmm. and really affected the industry. Um, well, it did. Yeah. Um, it affected the industry, but um, in the way that leather came into short supply um, and went up in price, um, that sort of thing. Uh, but that sort of came and went. So that wasn't a massive issue. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so in your time of making saddles, which now I realize is even longer than I thought, um, you've seen a lot of changes in the industry. Oh, I mean, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. you know, that I think the good news is that now there's a lot more attention into fitting a saddle to a horse, into, you know, what a saddle has to do. But the fundamentals of a saddle haven't really changed, have they? The, the reason for the fundamentals hasn't changed. No. Um, I mean, horses are very dynamic and they need something to uh, fulfill their needs in all gates, walk, trot and canter. And also the rider needs something to fulfill all their dynamics in those gates. Um, so that has never changed, but it, it sort of, it got lost um, a big time. Like I say, in the barren period of the sort of seventies, early eighties, um, it was it was really bad. You know, yeah. I mean, if Prince, if Prince Charles, uh, had anything about him, he'd have got involved in that as well as the architecture. Yeah. No, I mean, I remember my first saddle was a blue ribbon and it was a close contact saddle with open cell foam and a tiny bit of felt. And later mm -hmm. I took it apart and so it would never sit on another horse. <laughs> so. Yeah, you said close contact. I mean, that in itself is a little bit of a, a play on words as well, but we might just address that later when we're talking yep. and drawing. Yeah. All right. So um, so you decided to start out on your own because you really wanted to 
be involved with the horse and the rider, not just making a saddle. Is that right? Well, this, yeah, the, because I, I truly believe there's only one way to do it. And that is to address the horse and the rider as individuals. I mean, it's, it's, it's so kindergarten that all horses are different and all riders are different and their abilities are different as well. And so unless you address all of those things, then the saddle ends up being wrong and the rider can't ride it. A lot of riders, like you just said, they fight their equipment instead of riding the horse. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, I can, you know, I'll draw that for you in a second and make that a little bit obvious. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, and so what I wanted to do was um, be able to fit a horse and so that the horse was comfortable um, in work as well as, uh, you know, out on a hack or whatever. Um, and for the rider to be in balance, and that's the main thing, the rider has got to be in balance with the horse, as well as themselves. Right. Otherwise, as you know, it doesn't work. Right. That's, you know, yeah. I mean, so many people struggle because they are not in balance. And they are, you know, from my perspective as a riding instructor, we're not showing them how to be in balance because we've lost that understanding of anatomy and physiology and function. You know, so that's a, it's a, there's several factors in there, I think. There's so lots of factors. Huh? There's lots of factors. There's lots. lots of factors in there. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, well, let's let's just get started right away, and let's start with the horse first. So, um, okay. You now you have your whiteboard set up. I don't know if you want to go there now or. Well, I will go there, but I'll just explain um, that what I've had to do <laughs> to to get there. If I can just do that, does that work? Yeah, it's perfect. We, we can see your okay. whiteboard and what I'm going to do is make your image. Okay, when you're ready, I'll make your image. Okay, what I was going to explain, just in case we have an accident here, is <laughs> <laughs> that I've had to make, for the camera and for the whiteboard, I've had to make two, they're six feet tall, um, tripods out of timber, uh, because I needed to set this up. So if I uh, I tried it and if I got next to the whiteboard to draw, it was too far away for you to see. So I had to do it this way. So um, you, with our iPads as well, you have to be so careful because I'm gonna press this and turn it around. And, you know, pressing buttons on an iPad, you could put a pair of rabbit ears on you or a devil tail or something, you know. So you just gotta be really careful. All right, well, we'll uh, bear with you if there's a glitch here, don't worry. Well, if there's a glitch, you'll see. But what I ought to have done is booked a tango lesson with an octopus first, <laughs> so I could get some practice in dodging all these legs. Okay. T tell me if you can see that, Wayne. Yep, that's great. And like I said, I'm going to make it big so that it's uh, everybody can see it really clearly. Okay. Right. So, what we're looking at um, is the fact that the areas of a horse that need to be addressed when you're making a saddle. And there's lots of different areas. Uh, it's not just the back. Um, you've got, for example, the withers, you've got the spine, you've got the loins, you've got the elbow, you've got the natural girth line, um, you've got the ribs, and of course, you've got the last rib. So all of these things, so you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things that need to be addressed when you're gonna make a saddle. Those things have to be looked at in detail on each horse, because in a lot of cases, they're very different on each horse. And, and the so shoulder if, blade as well, right, Andy? Yeah, if you just pick one wind, and we'll start with that. Yeah, so I'm just gonna go down the list. So the first one is the shoulder or scapula. The shoulder. Okay, well, okay, that's obviously the one on the list, the one that you picked. Yeah, it's um, the first one on the list. <laughs> so, well, okay. So we got the, the scapula and there's a misconception that you have to completely miss the scapula altogether. Um, when I say a misconception, um, it's, it's true in essence that you don't put any pressure on it, but it's also true that if you missed it completely, the saddle would be so far behind where you needed it to be that you'd need a sky hook to hold the front of the saddle up because you, you've opened it so wide to miss a scapula. And really what you've got to do is you've got to 
with the scapula and then you've got the cartilage on it. You've got to miss that when it's in motion and coming back. So if you can imagine, how can I explain this? The front of the saddle has to be open in that area and it has to bear less in that area than it does in other areas. So in that area there, the scapula and the front of the saddle, if you could imagine the, hang on, I'm coming back. Okay. This could get messy, sorry. Okay. If you can imagine, where have you gone, Wynne? Oh, I'm here, I'm just small, okay. up the top. Okay, if you can imagine the tree, and we've got a tree like this, the front of the saddle, where the shoulder is and the horse, it needs to come up and away from the horse like this. So you know what the shape of a turtle shell is, where its head comes up and looks around? Oh yeah. Okay, so that's what needs to happen with the saddle because the horse needs that kind of room there. It doesn't have to be obvious so that you can see the huge gaps there, but the pressure has to be alleviated so that actually is allowed. Okay. In Western saddles, I think they call that the flare. Yeah, the, it, it, that's exactly what it does. It flares. Um, so the shoulder, what you don't need to do is impede it at all. And the other thing with the shoulder, while we're talking the shoulders, if you look down on a horse, you might have a very large say right shoulder and a smaller left shoulder looking down the spine of the horse and the saddle can find its resting spot on a large shoulder and go forward to seek its resting spot on a smaller shoulder and therefore it goes into a twist over to the opposite side of the large shoulder. So we're looking down on it like from the rider position looking down at the two shoulders. Yes there's the head two shoulders, spine. Got it. Okay, so if this is the arch of the tree, and there's the points, this side will go forward to seek its resting spot, and this one is blocked by a large shoulder. So the whole saddle goes into a twist over to the opposite way, like that. So shoulders um, and scapula really need to be looked at when you're actually looking at fitting a horse. Okay? Okay. So, what's next on the list? Withers. Withers. Oh, withers. Um, and this is kind of an odd looking horse that you've drawn, Andy. His withers are really forward and above his shoulder blade, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Okay, right. <laughs> I'm not gonna spy, I'm not gonna bite. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you look at withers, you look at different breeds of horses and a lot of them are, are very different in the wither area. And the withers themselves are there. If we, okay, so we, we, now we're cutting the horse through there and we're looking end on at the horse. Okay? Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. So at that point, you've got the withers. Now some horses, will have this same shape, but they'll have almost no withers, like that. The two horses can look really different, um, but the same saddle can actually fit both horses at that point, because the saddle comes over and then the panel comes into it like that. So what you can't do, you can fit a low withered horse with a high ridden saddle in that aspect but you can't go the other way around right so so the withers basically are there to be missed and only to be missed because you've got to keep them clear all the time and yeah because there's very little tissue covering the wither so it's like somebody wrapping your shins uh, it really is and if you think about it i'm coming back again If you think about it, if the withers are here, the iron arch of the tree has to miss those withers, okay? And so, depending on how high the withers are, 
you have to bring the front of the saddle up to Mr Withers so that you also then have to bring the back of the saddle up to balance it like this and those withers have to be clear all the time. Now if you've got a saddle or a horse rather that has got very high withers people always tend to use the if you like three finger rule mm -hmm. where um, sort of a pony club thing where they can get three fingers under there and I think that's okay but when the saddles when they're very extreme and you've got a very high wither so let's say you've got one like that you've got to bring the saddle up so high at that point to miss that wither but you then have got to bring the back up so high to actually balance the saddle through so what you do is you don't have to have three fingers there because as long as it's clear and it stays clear when being ridden, you can have one and a half fingers there because that way you haven't got to come up so high behind to balance it. And a, a large withered horse can mean you have to have a lot of panel in the back to keep that in balance. And, and when you're talking about clear all the time, you're talking about, you know, if somebody's going to stuff a thick uh, woolly saddle pad underneath, that could actually close that gap and then put pressure on the wither. So you have to absolutely, yeah. Check it the just needs to be, stuff. yeah. You do. You have to. It has to be kept clear. And the thing is that when, if you, <laughs> if I try and draw a normal horse, when a horse raises, the actual clearance at the wither on a tree gets greater because the horse raises in the back there and takes the saddle up there. And as he does, his withers lower. So the horse raises in this area and lowers in this area. So if you're looking at that and it's, you know, it looks relatively close, most people will stand in the stirrup iron, which is um, biased towards the front of a saddle. They'll stand in the iron lean forward and look over to see how much gap there is there. Well, they're putting all their weight in that area to do that. And it, it gives a false reading. Right. So as long as it's clear and it stays clear, that's the main thing. And then also, if you've got a saddle with... One sec. If you have a saddle that you have to bring up so high that you need to clear a very high wither. What you're actually doing is taking these points off the bearing surface of the horse. So you then have to elongate the points so that you're not taking the bearing surface completely away from the horse. Right. A lot of horses that have, like you said earlier on, um, what they term close contact saddles, they have atrophied at the base of the wither. So you've got the wither, and then you, you have horses with a very prominent shoulder and a lot of atrophy just behind the shoulder. Yeah. And that's because a lot of the saddles have very short points and the points actually are taken up when the, when the saddle goes up to clear the high wither, the points are also taken up. They go up as well. And so they form two points of contact on the horse that create the atrophied. Does that make sense? Yep. And so it reminds me of back in the 70s when these close contact saddles were really popular with the jumper riders that they would, they wanted close contact. So the panels were really thin, but they had high withered horses and then the horses exactly. get whacked in the withers and then they're adding all these pads and um, I'll never forget one time I went to look at a woman's saddle and because her horse was unhappy and I had I put the saddle on and it didn't look bad and then I asked her to tack up the horse and she put on three different pads a gel a fuzzy and a flat and by the time she got done the saddle didn't fit at all. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know if uh, I, I think you might have been there at the time when because I think it was you. I'm trying to think where we were and I was doing a talk in a big um, indoor arena and the indoor arena was being used when we when we got there and the horses had to empty out and the one horse came past and he said got what 
looked like three dead sheep stuffed under it, mm. under the saddle, um, and lots of pads, and it was like a Christmas cake. Mm. And it was so unstable that they actually surcingled the entire thing on to keep it down. And you, I'm sure you looked at me and you, you said, don't, don't say a <laughs> word. <laughs> it's like, I was like, what? Yeah. So yeah, that and that is a very common thing because the saddle, when when that happens, or when when it happens that the the points are short and there's an atrophy there, the the saddle tends to slide backwards into those holes, like that. And as soon as it slides backwards into those holes, of course, everything goes out of sync and it's all wrong. Right. So you you have to allow. That's, you know, you've got to build for what isn't there as well as what is there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've got to clear the shoulders, but not totally avoid the, in other words, there has to be a flare to kind of widen out yeah. the shoulder. And we have to clear yeah. the withers. And the shape of the withers is going to have an influence on how we clear them. It just has to stay clear all the time, not necessarily three fingers. Yeah, that's it. And as long as it's the same as the spine, should we move on to the spine next? Is that yep. next on the list? Yep. Okay, well, I mean, the spine, if you think about it, it's, it's basically there to be missed. <laughs> you've, you've got to give it all the room it needs to do what it needs to do. Um, and so therefore, if we look... Um, we look at this oops look at that oh. the under underside of the saddle yep. okay yep. where the gullet is um at that point that's a channel obviously for the spine so what you need um a saddle that fits has to have three at least three man's fingers clearance in that gullet because if it doesn't it impedes the spine and the spine not only uh, does it um, need to flex and bend, but it also does that slightly as well. So you need to give it clearance for it to do that. Um, some of the reasons that the saddles are, the, the gullet in the saddle is narrow, is because if you look at the width of the seat of a tree, they're too narrow. A lot of saddles are too narrow in general. They're only this wide. Okay. And if you think then you've got that wide, then you have to put a panel in there and there's no room to put the three finger clearance in the gullet because you've only got a narrow panel. So you really need to start with the correct width tree to begin with so that you can put all the bearing surface nicely onto the horse and clear his spine. And, and Andy, I know that you've looked at a lot of horses over a lot of years. Is that back width, uh, is there an average back width that the majority of horses need? Um, it, it's just like us when they, th there is more horses need it than don't need it, put it that way. Okay. Um, uh, but it's just like us, we're, we're all individual, they're all individual. So what you've got is, th this is what I'm trying to explain, Every horse is so individual. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, if, if you and Brad exchanged running shoes, you know, um, I know, yeah. I know the first thing that would happen is Brad would be really surprised because he forgot he owned a pair. But yep. anyway, um, <laughs> he's, he's going to kill me. Oh dear, he just uh, bought a pair, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I can just see the headlines now. Yeah. Angry jogger kills saddle maker. Um, <laughs> right. Police are looking for a large suspect tiptoed away in ballet shoes. Oh boy. Um, so, where were we when? Fine, we're on the spine, then we have to clear the spine, and you need a saddle that's going to clear that spine all the time. And you, you know. Do. This kind of goes back, we've done some webinars on anatomy with uh, Equisoma and they've shown us skeletons. And so I think I'm gonna call them up again to have them come back so we can really remember what that spine width looks like. Okay, well, if you, if you look at the horse, let's say we cut the horse through there now and look at him from that end on. Okay. Okay. What you really need 
is a broad base and then a broad panel over the horse's back. So that then when the pressure comes into it, the weight of the rider, etc., you've got a broad gullet that's clearing the spine, and then you've got broad bearing flat panels that are actually nice and kind for the horse's back. Um, what you tend to see if you have a narrow gullet and a narrow seat, there's not enough room to then make this correct, and you have round panels with a point contact on each one. So when the pressure goes on, that's when the horse tends to react. Um, and it can, uh, I've seen this so bad uh, that they've actually drilled holes into the horse's back that hold water. Ooh. They've calloused. Wow. And, you know, and the thing is that the actual one I remember this, um, when I went, it had calloused out to the edges like this and actually held water. And the, the guy looked, and I said, what on earth happened? You know, I could see what had happened. Um, and uh, he said, what, where, what do you mean? So, you know, horses suffer for this. Um, the other thing, of course, is what we were talking about just here, if you've got a very high wither and you have to lift the front of the saddle very high, you then have to lift the back of the saddle very high uh, to keep this balance through. And as soon as you do that, you have to put more panel in the saddle at this area. And in that respect, that saddle has to, the, the panels are even, if you like, well, they're always important. But what can happen and does happen, instead of adding depth through, they put a gusset in the panels. Um, this is looking from the back. Still, okay. he's the, sorry, he's the back of the horse. Okay. They're still looking from the back. And they put gussets in the panels, but they don't make them the right shape, a lot of them. And they put the point contact in the end. But what their aim is, is to have that depth to put the saddle back in balance. Um, so can you see where this is, when does this make sense that you, you're looking at it from the back of the horse? Right, so the gussets are to help give the height to level the saddle in relation yeah. to the withers. But you've got to make the gusset the correct shape to put the bearing surface on the horse like that. Right. And so you've got, you've got a gullet and then bearing surface. But a lot of them I've seen actually just do that and put a point contact there. Right, they're almost so triangle the, shaped. They are, and there's lots of ways that can go really wrong. So the, the object is to keep the spine clear. And while we're talking about this as well, horses generally, not always, but generally raise to the spine and they go down again. And in that respect, if you've got something like this going on, where you've either got, um, like we had before, where you've got the very tiny point contact of round panels. And I mean, if you think about it, if you press a saddle into wet clay and then take it away, that indentation should really um, resemble your horse's back to some degree. Okay. Um, but a lot of these, if you press them in, it looks like two rolling pins are being pressed into clay. Not, not it doesn't resemble a horse's back. Right. So. It, you know, none of it is, like I say, rocket science. Um, you just actually have to design for what's in front of you. And uh, these, these are very common. All this going on is very common. But what happens is that when you put a horse on the left rein, the saddle naturally wants to move to the right at the back. Put it on a right rein, it wants to move to the left at the back. And when I say move, I mean, it just it kisses across the body. If that happens and you've got some sort of aggravation going on here, and because horse is raised to the spine, that causes a dig into the spine as it goes across. As that goes across, that moves across and digs in to the raise of the spine or the edge of the spine. And that's where, if you look for horse's body language, it's the one thing that shows up a lot. 
if that's an arena and you have a horse going down the long side here, they can go down quite nicely uh, in a working outline, ears forward, um, head down. And as soon as they come to this bend and go around it, at that point, they snatch, they arch their back and slightly pin their ears. And then when they carry on, they go back to normal again. And it's because on that bend, that happened, made the cross and dug in into the side of the spine as it so, goes in. So the pressure was really on the left side of the spine, even though the saddle shifted right. Oh yeah, yeah, because as soon as that shifts right, this comes across and it hits the left side of the spine. Right. But, but horse's body language, you can see that happening, you know, really regularly. Um, and it's, it's something that uh, is sort of a no brainer. Um, you can tell what's happening. There's some discomfort on a bend. And that is one of the things that causes it. This, when the saddle doesn't sit right at the back, doesn't um, contour the horse properly at the back. Okay. So watching yeah. a horse travel on a straight line versus an arc is, or a, a corner actually, because you want to go back to that straight line is a really good way to get a sense of how things are functioning. Yeah, when I fit a saddle, I always say you have to fit a horse because it, it's impossible because horses are so dynamic. You can't fit a horse um, statically. Uh, you have to see the horse ridden in walk, trot and canter. Um, because in each gate, it will do something different and tell you something different. Um, an example is in walk, if you, if you look, let's say, I'll use a clean face so I don't get mixed up. I thought I'd bought a really thick flip chart. We can always use the other sides if we need to. It's got, it's got very thick paper, so there's not many sheets. Um, so if you look, and that's the, looking from the back of the horse, and here's his bum, and here's his tail. When horses walk, they swagger, don't they? Left to right, left to right. Well, some horses will go um, left to right two inches, and other horses will go left to right as a step under 11 inches like that. Now, if you've got something on their backs that's creating um, pressure or a sore point or something that doesn't marry with their, their back properly, in the walk, horses can get extremely sore. And that's when the, the back of the saddle, if you look at it like that, the back of the saddle, while the horse is going left and right there, this is rubbing at that point. So it's not a case of the saddle rubbing the horse, it's actually the horse rubbing the saddle. Because <laughs> they move, yeah, there's so it, much going up through the spine. It has exactly the same effect. So what you need to do where the panel leaves, not only do you need to have a nice broad bearing surface, nice and kind on his back. But you also need, where it leaves, you need to start leaving sooner than the very end of the saddle. So you just kiss the flesh goodbye on the way up. And so you've got to fit a, if you don't fit a horse in walk, then you're going, you're going to hurt the horse um, because that doesn't actually happen in canter or trot. It only happens in walk. Um, because that's when the horse swaggers. In right. canter, it's a driving force. So in canter, something else comes into play, which we'll go on to in a minute when we're talking of the, the, the rider. Um, but all these things show us something different. So fitting a static horse is, isn't on, you can't do it. They're just too dynamic. Um, you have to fit them in all gates so that in motion, the saddle does what it's supposed to do um, all the time instead of just in one gait or statically. That's why you can't assess a saddle in a barn aisle. Right. You can't just look at a saddle and say if it's right or wrong, because it changes uh, as soon as the um, girth is girthed up and as soon as the rider's on board. That, those two things in themselves change it. You, you can make a general assessment of this really doesn't fit, 
but you can oh yeah yeah it. you can you can see a big red red light absolutely yeah um but what you can't tell is if you put it on and it looks like it fits you can't be 100 percent sure if it really does fit right um I'll, I'll try and explain that um this let's say this is the horse the thing is with this the the horse the saddle and and the rider are so involved with each other that what we're talking about here we we cross over all the time so we can't just talk about a horse without including something from the saddle or the rider um it's not as easy as going down the list for the horse then the list for the rider etc um because the the horse's confirmation really comes into play for example let's say you put this saddle on in a barn aisle and you looked at it and you said yeah that's fine that fits everything's all right and then let's say that this is before it's girthed up and then you girth it up well every horse has only got one natural girth groove and so that natural girth groove is dictated by the ribs and the belly um, and a lot of horses today because of the breeding have big ribs and big bellies and so therefore the natural girth line is much further forward than it used to be When you're either going to have to whistle yeah. or answer me because I, I don't know if we've been cut off or not. Because no, can't we're see good. You. We're good. We're okay. We're just, okay. Just well, Danny, well, I'm just like I just I just thought I was talking to trying. myself for a bit then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the point is, okay, let's. I'm just doing an example. You've put this saddle on, and it sits in balance. And we're at this moment in time, we're assuming it fits the rider. Um, it sits in balance. But because of this tummy and because of these big ribs, the girth line is here, it's far forward. So the girth straps come down from the saddle here, but you actually want to anchor it to the, the girth to its natural girth groove there. So even if you put that on and tighten that up um, as tight as you can, which obviously you shouldn't, you shouldn't use elastic and be kind, but if you tighten that up, as soon as that horse walks, moves, does anything at all, it's going to go to there because it wants to go to the nar narrowest point and this is making it go there as soon as this goes there these straps want to follow it obviously and as soon as those straps follow it to there this saddle is going to go forwards because it wants to line back up with its girth straps so it's going to come forwards like I'll exaggerate the point, like that. And as soon as it comes forwards, it's done a chain reaction. It's not only come forward and blocked the shoulder completely, but it's gone up in front and it's gone down behind. So now it's putting all the pressure on the loins of the horse and the rider, instead of sitting central, the rider said, gravity says, nope, you've got to sit there. So the rider then has to sit in the back third of the saddle, which impounds all the pressure on the loins. And with the loins blocked, sorry, the shoulder blocked and the loins jabbed, the first thing the horse is going to do is lower his back. And as soon as he lowers his back, his head comes up because that is akin to somebody sticking their thumb knuckles into our kidneys. The first thing they do, we do, and the first thing the horse does, is take evasive action to get away from it and dodge out of the way and sink. And as soon as he sinks, his head's going to come up, just like our neck goes back, if it happened to us. Right. Um, right. And as soon as his head comes up, all four legs are going to lock up because they can't work in that position with a horse with an inverted back and his head in the midair. Uh, it doesn't work that way. So just by this girth line being out, it's ruined everything else. Because now, we'll go to the rider in a minute, but the rider is completely out of balance. And as soon as the rider is out of balance with a horse, um, that is very much like us carrying a child on our shoulders and they're with us, 
But as soon as they lean backwards to wave to one of their friends, we have to take a step backwards to counter their weight because they're no longer in balance with us. And as soon as we have to take a step backwards to try and counter their weight, um, everything goes pear-shaped because you're trying to find each other again. And as soon as a rider gets behind the motion of the horse, that's exactly what the horse is feeling. Right. He's lost, he's lost the balance and the continuity with the rider. So, so what we're talking about here, just so that I'm clear, is that uh, because we had a question about the panels but I, and the spine, but I've got to go back there in a minute. What we're talking about okay. here is that, and, and this is a problem of our breeding. We have bred horses with well-sprung ribs, big bellies, and very forward girth lines. And if the saddle, and it's not always possible to accommodate 100% of that, but in the case, like I'm thinking of an Arab that I remember had a, had, its girth line was actually toward the head of its elbow in front of its elbow and so that girth would just big belly it was one of Joyce's horse big belly um Maggie and so the girth would slide forward into the girth groove just in front of the elbow and then drag the whole saddle up on top of her shoulders which then put the rider in a chair seat because the front of the saddle goes up the back of the saddle goes down and yep. you know like in her case I don't even remember that we ever solved that yeah, I mean, that is, that is a very common thing. And it's the only thing that um, could physically stop you fitting any horse. And I don't mean um, every horse that's got a forward girth line can't be fitted. But if the girth line is further forward than the shoulder, then it's a physical impossibility because right. it's always going to bring that saddle forward. Right. Um, right. And it, it just won't work. It, it's like putting a collar on... A dog with a little head with a big fat neck you know yeah. it ain't gonna work yeah. it just yeah. isn't gonna work it's gonna want to go there you yeah know? I, I, know, I remember another arab and they actually retired him at, at five because he it was the same scenario and we searched and searched for a saddle but his confirmation just just there was no saddle that was going to fit where his girth line was it was so far forward. Yeah, you see, saddle making is, I mean, there's always, you know, questions, is it an art or is it uh, a science? And it, it, I believe it's truly an art. And it's also an art and engineering mixed. Um, and I think the engine, you have to understand the engineering to make it into an art. Um, and there's a lot of things that you have to do uh, that relate to engineering. Although you're working with flesh and, and bone and blood, you still have to use certain engineering aspects in the making of a saddle. Right. And and this girth line being forward, it's a it's a function of our breeding because I, I mean I can remember in fact if you look at Western saddles they'll talk about something called center fire, meaning that the girth groove was you know back toward the middle of the horse. So yeah. things have changed over time. That is a saddle maker's dream. Yeah. Absolutely. It really, no, it really is. Let's just um, talk about that, that for a moment. Okay. So if you can imagine, can you still see this bottom of the page? Um, you have to can switch you... our camera. Ah. We're staring at your shop. Okay. No. All right. You caught me out. Right. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Rabbit's ears. Okay. Um, so you have, can you see, <laughs> okay, I'll ask again. <laughs> can you see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, if you have your horse there, and if you look at oil paintings from the 1700s and that sort of time, 16, 1700s, horses tended to be with a girth there and their elbow, elbows here and their saddles sit there and they can have a nice central strap in and everything is anchored down um, and it doesn't want to go backwards or forwards because the girth line's in the right place. Um, and if you look back in history, that's how it used to be. But nowadays you see this more. So what you have to do is you have to girth, put the girth straps in the correct alignment. So if you have your horse and then you have your tree, the most furthest forward, so we have a, oops, a belly, the most furthest forward point of the tree actually is the point. 
And so if you put a point strap on, you can line the point strap up with a forward girth line. And by coming to the furthest forward point of the structure of the tree, that actually holds the saddle back as far as possible. And at that point, you cannot just anchor the front down. Anchor is probably too strong a word, but you can't have the front down. So what you need is a balance as well, so that you're actually anchoring the saddle at three different points. And therefore you're pulling it down nice and even all through. This looks you're... a lot like a Western rigging on a saddle. Yeah, I mean, there are all different types, but all different breeds of horse determine that there needs to be different types of strapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can see if that was from the 1700s and we had the horse there like that, that could be just strapped down like that. Right. But you, we can't do that now. No, because very few. And this is a breeding problem. This isn't something you're going to solve. Exactly, over. yeah. Yeah, it, it's something we haven't paid attention to in the breeding, which res results in a riding problem. Mm -hmm. okay. So what's what's next on the list? Wendy? Well, let's, let's kind of recap a little bit. If you just draw uh, a horse and we talk about so you got to clear the shoulder, right? Yeah, yeah. So that wait, we can, wait, wait. There was a question back there about the gussets, and I want to come back and get that. So we have to clear the shoulder. We've yep. got to clear the withers. Yep. We've got to clear the spine. Yep. And then when we get to the loins, we talked about, uh, I think we, we skipped it a little bit in that we have to, um, some, there was a question about gusseted saddles. And like, wait, let me see if I can go back to it. Uh, yeah. How, about the shape of the back of the gusset. So we looked at the, the, the panel has to clear the spine, but what about the shape of that panel? Have we talked about that in terms of the shape of the horse? Um, yeah, I mean, where are we? We, we did this and we talked about having a nice flat bearing surface and you asked the question, is this an almost generic shape? Yes, that's right. I did ask that question. Yeah. Um, well, in, in actual fact, it is a lot more generic than you'd think. Um, simply because if you look at this area of a horse um, and what we looked at, well, because of the back measure, I've got decades of measurements of all breeds of horses uh, of all ages and all heights. And that back measure is in the in the background of this whiteboard. So if you want to see what it looks like, just look to the left there and you'll see it with all the pegs. Yeah. Um, and so each one of those pegs is calibrated so that when it's taken on a horse's back, um, the horse then has its own number um, because they're all calibrated. You can write them down. Um, and by doing that, you can then examine your results. And a lot of horses are extremely different in this area. And when I say extremely, they are extremely different in that area on their backs. But believe it or not, in this area, they're very, there's very little difference. So the there's, wither area can change quite a bit while the lot. area yeah. at the back of the saddle is pretty consistent. Yes. Um, and once again, it doesn't apply. It's not like written in stone. Um, I'm not saying they're all exactly like this because they're not, but they are more of them are regular there than they are there. At the back rather than the front. But what about the yeah. contour of the horse's back? The, the, in other words, a dippy back horse versus a really flat back horse. Well, once again, you see, when you're fitting a saddle for a horse, you've got to look at not only the breed and the shape of the horse, but you've got to look at the ability of the horse and the ability of the rider because it would be, uh, how can I explain this? Okay, so let's say you're making a, a saddle for a dressage rider that is, um, 
can find a blank piece of paper. You're making a saddle for a dressage rider that is very trained and they can raise their horses back an awful lot. Okay, so almost as soon as they get on the horse, the head comes down um, and the back lifts. Um, in that respect, that horse needs a lot of room to lift in this area. And with the back measure, I take it so that I give the horse a belly lift when I'm taking the measurement. So it, it creates an artificial um, working outline. Um, I don't just do that. I do it in conjunction with watching the horse actually work and videoing the horse. But as a piece of the jigsaw, I give it a belly lift and it raises into the measure and then I drop the pegs into that raised shape. And then what I do when I'm making the saddle is I give even more room for that horse to lift because what you've got to think of is you're going to have to add the weight of a rider once the saddle has been made. And so you make it so that it's quite flat or quite open there and the horse can raise into it. Um, but you've just said a very dippy backed horse. Yes. And yes. If, if you have a very dippy backed horse like this and they don't raise their back, if you made a saddle like that, you would obviously make a bridge. Then you'd have a point contact and a point contact, and then the horse would get crippled there and there. So, what you have to do is follow the contour of the horse to their capabilities. Now, you'd still give that horse a belly lift and see what you could get out of it. But a lot of times what you have to do is build for what is in front of you on the day because you can't anticipate what that horse is going to be doing in six months time. So it's no use looking down the line and thinking I'll give it a load of room because in six months time it'll be using it because if you do you'll cripple it while it's trying to get there. Right. Okay. Uh Yep, and so in terms of the, you started to talk about uh, the panels having to like kiss and leave at the loin area. So can you talk a little bit more about the, you know, where the saddle has to leave, a little bit about the last ribs, the loins? Okay, okay. The, the, the last rib is a, is a big thing um, because if you read books and, and listen to a lot of people, um, and they say that uh, a saddle should not be, it's a, it's a very, it's a very far back last rib. Yes. Hang on a second. It's a, you can give it's more a very, yep. It's a very long horse. Okay, it looks like a cow, but no, it's a horse, right? So we've got a last rib. Um, the, the horse determines um, what size tree you need to use on it. And also, the rider has an input, obviously, as to what size tree you need. Why don't I just draw it this way and it would make more sense. Let's start with a saddle. And let's start with a rider. And the object is to keep that nice balance line through. Okay. Now, at this point, if you have the stirrup leather in the average length, that makes this predetermined angle. Then I know where to design cut and make the flap. When the thigh comes into it, the bump, I then know where to put the thigh block, how big, how long, whatever. Now, when the horse comes into it, the panel is there. Let's say the rider needs a 17 and a half inch seat, but the horse or tree, the horse needs an 18 and a half inch tree. What we do is make the inner seat fit the rider and the horse has a bearing surface it needs all the way through. Now the last rib, let's say, oops, let's say the last rib. People say you shouldn't bear over it. You don't want to bear on the unsupported spine, obviously. But if you, what you can do is you can bear out 
and over the last rib as long as the buried surface doesn't go past the last rib. But if somebody looks at that, they'd say, well, if there's the last rib, the saddle's here, you've gone past the last rib. But in actual fact, you're not bearing on it, you're leaving the horse at it. So you're not bearing on the unsupported spine. But if the alternative to that is if you make a saddle that, and a lot of people have a small saddle like this, that, that they think fits a rider and they go to a 16 and a half inch saddle, all the weight is coming back into this area and it's putting a lot of pressure on the horse's back there. And so their weight is being drilled into the horse at that point. Because in essence, they're sitting in the back third of the saddle and they're not sitting centrally. So in other words, if you put a smaller saddle on a short back horse to accommodate the short back, but the saddle isn't fitting the rider because they need a longer saddle, you're actually gonna concentrate the weight onto the horse's lower, uh, not lower back, but back into the rib cage. Yeah, that's one of the, that's one of the most common things that you see. Um, it's, it's riders that have a saddle that is too short. And so what they then do is um, the saddle that's short is causing a problem behind. And as soon as it causes a problem behind and digs in behind because it's too short, they think it's too long. And so they actually, in a lot of cases, pull it further forward. And only move the problem a little more forward. Yeah. So, so then how do you determine the length of the tree for the horse? It's something that you can't measure. It's something that I can look at and know in a heartbeat what that horse needs. Um, but to quantify it uh, is quite difficult because what I want to do is put it in conjunction with the rider and sit the rider in balance uh, over the horse's balance. And so therefore, um, we always, what I always use is the demonstrator and I put them in the demonstrator saddle. Um, and the first thing I do is get their, their seat bone to stirrup bar relationship, which is the most important thing. And that's where all subtle design is born and starts. Okay, so we're gonna it's, get to the rider in a minute, but I just wanna, I think I wanna clarify this point a little bit in terms of, you. You want the panels to distribute the weight over the horse's rib area, is that right? Where do we want that weight distributed and where don't we want that weight? Well, you don't, well all the places that we mentioned, you don't want it on the, the spine, you don't want it on the withers, you don't want it on the shoulder, you don't want it on the loins. Um, so yes, you can span it out over the ribs, um, but what you need to do is span it kindly. So you want to make a saddle uh, as though it's a pair of skis, if you like, rather than a pair of stilettos on the horse's back. You've got to have um, a broad bearing surface and you've got to fit the horse kindly. Otherwise, if there's any pressure points and the pressure's got to be nice and even, and that's where the dynamics come into it because you, you can make a saddle even on a static horse, but when the dynamics come into it, that evenness can be uneven because you could be putting more pressure in certain areas. So that's why you have to see a horse ridden in walk, trot and canter and allow for all that dynamics. So, so regardless of any saddle anybody's ever gonna look at, they really need to see that horse moving under that individual saddle, not under. Yeah, not and it's, it, it's a misconception, sorry when to put in, it's a misconception that a saddle has got to fit the horse. And I've had this said so many times in my life, that don't worry about me, he's in agony just for him and make sure he's all right. But if, if you just did that, then the horse could still be um, in problems anyway, because if it doesn't fit the rider, then the horse can have, you know, the effects of that. Um, and the, the small saddle is one of them. Um, and another one, I'll just explain this briefly while we're on the subject. Um, I made a saddle once for a lady um, going back some years. Um, are you turning your camera? I might do if you ask nice. <laughs> okay. Um, and the, the saddle itself, she was a small lady and um, she had a small horse. And I made her a dressage saddle and everything was fine. And she sat into it really nicely. Um, everything went, went well. 
And then um, she phoned me up and said, that's all wrong. She said that a horse had got a really sore back. And I said, um, okay, I went out, it was down in London. I went out, I looked at it and the horse was really sore in this area. And uh, it didn't make any sense because everything fitted properly. The girth was right, the panels were right, everything was right. And I said to her, can you ride it for me? She sat on it and it was perfect. And it was just kissing the flesh here, goodbye, as it went. And it was uh, very sort of even all through, but the horse was very marked in this area and sore. Um, so I said, I digged a bit deeper and eventually took us a long story short. Uh, her instructor, she was probably five foot. Her instructor came out who was male and six foot four. And he had been riding in the saddle and he had been sitting <laughs> on the cantle, trying to keep his legs <laughs> back behind the front of the flap, sitting on the cantle and he was driving that into the horse and he was doing most of the riding yeah. on that saddle and horse. But because I'd made the saddle for the horse, they couldn't understand why the horse was sore. Got it. So do saddle. we want to talk about the rider next for, or the saddle next? You have the saddle next, but it looks like we're getting into the rider here. So maybe we should go there. Okay. So what does a saddle need to do for a rider? Um, it needs to be in balance. It needs to be comfortable. It needs to fit everywhere it touches properly and it, it shouldn't have any um, obnoxious places. So what I do is I always start, I'll just turn this around again. I always start by getting the, um, this is so disconcerting you know, when because I can't see you. Oh, well, I can, I can make no. it so you can, but this way everybody can really see what you're doing. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not that's gonna talk <laughs> You probably so, have a That's a four position stirrup bar. And if you move it, it's in inch increments like that. And so this we can use to align the rider into their center. So somewhere along there is right and right for everybody. Now in conjunction with that, the seat bones, the seat bones of the rider have to be placed in the correct place on the seat. So if we go back to the, and yes, before you ask, Thank you. Okay. If we go back to there, what you have to have is a nice central position, seat bones nice and center. And then, as I drew before. And we're talking about a dressage saddle now, right? We, we, we'll keep it to dressage for now, but all the rules apply all the way throughout the disciplines. Um, they've, they've all got their own rules and they're basically the same. I remember when you used one of my saddles on a, a barrel race, or was it? Was oh, it's a rainer. Was, was my saddle on a rainer with a guy that was six foot four. <laughs> and you drew red lines through him or something, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, as we said before, the object is to keep this nice and straight through. The things that go to spoil it are if the stirrup bar is too far forwards. Because if that stirrup bar is too far forwards in relation to your seat bones and relation to your center, what happens is you have to, to maintain your center and to maintain your balance, you have to draw that backwards off the vertical, the actual stirrup leather. And as soon as you don't draw it backwards. In other words, this is where riders fight their equipment. They're constantly drawing this backwards. As soon as you don't and you think of something else, your shoulders, your hands or whatever, that stirrup leather is going to pull your foot forward. It's going to let your knee come up and your seat will go back. And that's when people, like you said about Joyce, in that sort of slump into a chair seat. So what we need to do is put the stirrup bar in the correct alignment so that there isn't any tension and that position can be maintained naturally and relaxed so that that's completely there. And that makes a difference because if you 
um, rise in the saddle, if you post in the saddle, if your stirrup bar is too far forwards, what you've got to do when you stand to rise, you have to heave yourself forward to get over the center of that stirrup bar. Because when your weight goes into that, this stirrup lever wants to go perpendicular to the ground, obviously. So to get your balance, you have to go over the center of that stirrup bar. So what we need to do is not do that, but put it in the correct place. So that then when you push down, you literally can just rise up. And it's a very relaxed rising, rising post. So someone's asking if you can move a stirrup bar back on a saddle. Generally, the answer is no, simply because they're riveted uh, and they're riveted through the timber and through the metalwork of the um, tree. And if you unrivet it, you're left with three quite big holes in the woodwork and metalwork. Um, and then you've got to drill, well, six holes, three each side. And then you've got to drill six more holes through the tree. Um, so you basically would weaken the tree right. if you moved it. Well, and this is where the equivans that I uh, came up with years and years ago were to uh, help riders with stirrup bars that are too far forward so they can find their balance. But we'll talk about that some other time, Laurie. I just want you to know that I came up with a, a, a temporary solution at least to help riders feel what that's like to be in balance by um, keeping the stirrups from swinging forward, essentially. And so, yeah. Andy, Kind of like the reverse of the of the problem with the girth line too far forward this is where the stirrup bar is too far forward and it's going to drag the rider's leg forward yep. when not holding it back and to hold it back creates a lot of tension exactly um and you want to be relaxed when you're riding and so you want this to be a nice relaxed position and with this going on you can't it's impossible to be that relaxed when it's pulling so far forward but two things happen the chain reaction as soon as your foot comes forward and your knee comes up and your seat goes back, of course, then you're putting more weight into the back of the horse at that point because your body weight is going backwards into the horse instead of straight down and being in balance. And that's one of the things that when you're out of balance with the horse, the kid on the shoulders, that happens when this happens. Right. So, is there ever so, a the stirrup bar is too far back? I was just going to say, you can have too much of a good thing. <laughs> so if you put it too far, yeah, if you put it too far back, then obviously it's having the opposite effect. And as soon as you put weight in it, you are tipped forward because this wants to shoot out behind you. So that has got to be right. It's got to be in the correct position um, because otherwise, if it's not right, either one of these happens and it's a bit like a pendulum. Um, it's a little bit like if you stood, uh, if you had a, a kid's swing in the garden with a seat and you stood on that and you got your balance, if somebody came behind you and just pushed you suddenly, all of a sudden you've got to refine your balance because it's gone. And this is a little bit like that. <laughs> you've got to try and find your balance, whereas you should actually just have your balance should be built in. Right. If you imagine, if you imagine the native Indians, they didn't have saddles to influence them one way or the other, but they had a natural balance. Um, and you know, they, they could ride because they had a natural balance. Um, and what a lot of saddles has done over the years, and we're talking about the saddles in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, um, they made a lot of uh, riders into passengers because they were so wrong they couldn't do anything except sit in them. Right. They, they were ineffective as a rider. Um, and that might sound like an exaggeration, but it really isn't because there are so many aspects to this that if you get any one of these wrong, we talked to the girth line earlier on, uh, if that's wrong, it all goes out of sync. If this is wrong, it all goes out of sync. And that's only two of how many, you know, 10 things. Right. Um, so, so with this, the seat bones sorted, that sorted, the stirrup bar sorted, then 
as a designer, as a maker, um, that tells me where to cut the front, bottom, back of the flap. And as I said before, when the rider, when the leg comes into it, that tells me how much or how little, if any, thigh block to put in there. And you don't want that thigh block to be in the way, um, but you want it there if you need it. So you need a, like a hand's width in between your leg and the thigh block until you need it. Um, and some riders and some horses, Iberian breeds of horse, a lot of them don't have a thigh block because they haven't got the big impulsion of the warm bloods. And so um, just to, to bring up another point here, when you talk about the saddle, say the, the saddle that's been drug forward by the forward girth uh, line, mm -hmm. can you draw mm -hmm. that saddle again for us? Because then we can see how that's gonna influence the rider's balance, because we can put the rider into it. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's say it's already gone forwards to save yep. me overdrawing it. Yep. So on the shelf, this, this saddle, they could have sat in it like in the tack shop and everything was great and it felt like the stirrup bar was in the right place and everything's fine. And then. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and then this happens uh, with the girthing system because of this, this happens. And as soon as it does, let's, Say, for instance, with the stirrup bowl was in the correct place, okay, to begin with, right? Now this saddle has just gone forward. Let's say it's gone forward two inches. Okay. Already the stirrup bowl that was in the correct place is now two inches too far forwards. And the centre seat of the rider can't be a centre seat anymore simply because gravity is putting them in the back of the seat in there. So their leg has been drawn completely forward. Their, it's, it's even hard to draw. Their, their leg has been draw, uh, drawn completely forward and their seat has been dumped in the back of the saddle. And so the, once again, like I say, totally ineffective. You can't ride a horse. And at this point, don't forget, at this point, you've already blocked his shoulders and dug in his loins. So now his back is dipped and his head's in the air. So you're, you are completely out of balance, completely out of sync. And so is he. Right. Your stirrup leather might be straight, but that's the only thing that's vertical and the girth. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, your stirrup leather wouldn't be straight at that point because your stirrup bar is now two, two inches too far forwards. Right. So, so even that's gone wrong. Right, but it's drunk. Yeah. Your whole leg's gone forward and your butt's gone back. So the distance has gotten greater that you have to try and heave yourself up over your stirrup bar. Yes, greater. And the thing is that as I was talking here, your seat bones to stirrup bar relationship. Maybe we can draw that in another picture because it's getting a little bit black. <laughs> knew you were trouble. <laughs> okay. Hang on a sec. Okay. Somebody so. said you should have different color pens, but since we're dealing with black, we just need a fresh sheet. That's all. Oh, okay. What color, what color would you like? Uh, red, I think, would show up really well. Okay, when? 30 years I've put up with this. <laughs> okay, so. I don't know, does that show up well? I don't think it does. Does it? Uh, I don't know, keep going. Yep. Is that okay? Yep. Okay, we all need a little bit of colour in our lives. There we go. Okay, so what was the question? <laughs> Seat bone to stirrup our relationship. Oh, okay. So your, your seat bones and your stirrup bar, that distance between your seat bones and your stirrup bar, that distance is crucial. And somewhere along that track is right for everybody, for every discipline. But first, before you design a saddle, 
you have to find out what that is. Okay, for the individual okay. and their horse. So once you've found that out, you can then design the complete and all the saddle around that position. So now use your black to draw the rider's leg in. Okay. I'm slightly side onto this, so I'm not sure how accurate it's all. It's okay, we get it. It's, it's all. <laughs> I've known Andy a lot. We're like an old married couple. <laughs> I was going to say 30 years I've put up with this. Okay. So. Ish. Okay. Yep. So that. That is it. And with that, oops. We need a foot. There we go. Mm -hmm. So that, like I say, and if you can imagine, if you sit on the couch at home, both feet flat on the floor, and then try and stand up without using the arms or your arms. Okay. Now imagine sitting on a milking stool with your feet each side of it, and then stand up. The difference is that great when the stirrup bar and the seat bones are in the wrong place. Because the further apart these are, the harder it gets. And so when the saddle is up in front, it's increased that distance between the stirrup bar and the deepest part of the seat? When the saddle goes forward? Yeah, and the head rises. Yeah, the saddle goes forward. So therefore it takes a stirrup bar with it. Okay, new it's uh, <laughs> when, you, how many time, How many times do you want me to explain the same thing? But, well, I just want to make sure everybody gets it, right? Okay, okay. This so, is the crucial piece for the rider. This is what I deal with. <laughs> okay, so if this saddle goes forwards because of whatever reason, let's yep. say it's the girth line and that's the general reason, um, if it goes forwards, that is a static bar. It's attached to the tree. It's solid. It won't move. So as soon as the tree comes forward, therefore the bar comes forward as well. And as soon as that bar comes forward, that means that foot's going to come forward because it wants to line back up. There we go. Is Lovely the colors. Looks great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever, wind. Whatever. Did you know I've done a full day's work before I did this for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was I nearly said you're worth it then, but <laughs> um so yeah, so if that goes forward, then that seat bones goes back because the saddle in essence does that. There we go. Lovely with so them. okay. So the seat bones go back. So my point is, if you're listening this time, then, my point is this distance is greater than this distance. Yeah. Okay. So that distance starts to get like you're trying to get up off the couch at home without using your arms. So somebody is really appreciating. She's just got it. She got it. Uh, okay. The color. So, <laughs> the color helps yeah. okay well sorry probably my fault but anyway okay. so that one is your milking stool standing up off your milking stool that one is getting up off your couch yep and it, it just makes a huge huge difference and that can be to any degree and believe it or not three-eighths of an inch in saddle making or in balance makes the world a difference to the actual feel and the ride of the horse. It makes so a huge difference. A huge amount, it just that it, when that happens, it's going to start throwing you out of balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I fitted a, a saddle for a lady and she we used the adjustable bar um, to find her balance. And in the first instance, if I just turn this around so I can show you the tree. Okay, so what we did, we put the stirrup bar 
in what we call position number two to begin with um, for it to try. And the horse went average. And now and again, his ears were twitching slightly, but he went average. And we didn't move anything, we didn't change anything at all, except with her still on the horse and it's still girthed up, I put the bar in position three, like that. The difference in the horse and the way he went was unbelievable. Um, his head went straight down, his ears went forward, his back raised, and all that was was an inch difference in the stirrup bar. And that's simply because what it did, it not only arranged the rider, well, it, it not only made him happy, but it was because it put the rider in balance with his balance. So with just that slight forward like that, she was just out of his sink just that much to make a big difference. And doing, by doing that, he was very, very happy. So when I say a little bit, it really does go a long way. Um, it's, it's working in such small increments. And that's why with the back measure, um, it's because it's calibrated, it gives us so much accuracy to measure the horse's back and to keep everything clear from the horse where it shouldn't touch. Um, all these things really, really matter. So Andy, can you grab a uh, green and draw what happens when the saddle slides backwards so that the head goes down and the back of the saddle goes up? Yeah, this happens generally um, more on thoroughbreds um, than it does on most of the breeds. Um, and that is because thoroughbreds out, out of, that they can be very skinny. I'm not saying they all are. Um, they can have a less of a barrel. So they have a more cylinder body rather than the bulge of, you know, a, a horse with a big tummy. Um, and so therefore they can hold their girth slightly further back than uh, the ones we talked about earlier. And because the girth is slightly further back, um, the saddle itself uh, is actually fine. It's anchored, it's okay. Um, and everything's fine if you just use the normal girthing system on it, like so. But because of their shape of their body, they tend, their shoulders tend to be more prominent. Um, and behind the shoulder, you have an atrophied. And it, what happens is that that atrophied works when you have the point of the tree, it gets influenced by the drop on the shoulder. In other words, the contour of the body of the shoulder. And so the tree goes down and it finds its resting spot in the atrophied. So as it goes back like that, it then lowers the front of the saddle. Can't go much lower, but it lowers the front and it raises the back. So what you find is the back is flipping up and away off the horse's back because mm -hmm. it's gone down in front and therefore it goes up behind. And the other thing it does, of course, is it unseats the rider and they're unbalanced because they're now not central anymore, but they're being forced forward on the saddle. And that effectively moves the stirrup bar back, doesn't back. it? Yes, it does, yeah. And so once again, you've got that thing where the foot wants to fly out behind. Right. Because it's done that, and therefore yep. it, it wants to follow it. Okay. So uh, hopefully, Kim, that answers your question there. Uh, okay. All right. So now we've looked at the legs of the rider and the balance. What about the bum? The bum. Okay. Well, <laughs> you have to fit what's there. Um, and so if I have a, actually I do it on there. If you have the seat of a saddle, like I say, I'm off center to this, so I can't see how accurate it is. Okay. Um, the, the bum, oh, when the rider's bum comes into it. Hmm. Basically what they, what they have already got, what the rider's already got, um, you have to allow for, or, 
what they haven't got, you have to make up for. So in other words, a rider with a big bum generally, obviously, would have a slightly bigger tree because you still want to sit that rider with a big bum central in the saddle. You don't want them to sit in the back third. So therefore you lengthen the tree so they're still in the center. So, so grab another color and show us what you do for the little skinny bummed person. Um, okay, so let's say that's the seat there and let's say that's the little skinny bummed person. What I do is I build the back of the seat in so that the rider can have the seat that they need and no more and the horse gets the bearing surface and the benefit of the saddle that the tree that he needs. So you can make an eight, a 17 inch or a 17 and a half inch inner seat for the rider on an 18 or an 18 and a half inch tree for the horse. So the horse really determines that tree's length. Yeah, it, the horse determines the tree length in 99.9% .9 of the cases. If you've got somebody that's really big, then obviously they're going to have a factor in it. And if they're riding um, a small horse, um, and I've actually done this, um, they, <laughs> the one lady was, um, she was blessed uh, with a big bum and she went off to get a horse and as she came back around the corner, I expected her to be leading a sort of, you know, 16 hand, 17 hand horse. And she got a 14 hand horse and she was she was quite tall as well um the, the lady was and so there's no way that i could then let the horse determine the tree size she determined the tree size because if i'd have made a saddle to fit that horse in essence she would have done to it what that trainer did right. to his client so i had to make her a 19 inch saddle but then where this where the bearing surface of the horse, it's all wrong, but where the bearing surface of the saddle left the little 14 hand and his last rib, I had to alleviate all the pressure as we left his last rib, but still give her the tree size she needed. So although the horse, the tree was, it looked oversized for the horse, the actual horse was only getting bared on the area where he could actually carry it. And you do that by shaping the panel. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So now let's talk about the rider's pelvis. Okay. What do you want to know? Well, you know, how do you, how do you know what I'm reading your notes, Andy, it says pelvis narrow or wide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I need to get agitated. You just right. set me up on that one. Well, the thing is that you know, um, there's a big hoo-ha about lady saddles and gent saddles and that, and there is no such thing because we're all different. We all come in different shapes and sizes. And um, so what suits a gent, one gent, probably wouldn't even suit 10 other gents, but it would suit five ladies. So there, there, is, there is no thing. What it is is that you need to, you, if you're looking at the pelvis and the saddle, you don't want that to happen. That's two before, right? You don't want that to happen because that isn't going to work either. What you actually want is that. So what you need to do is make a seat that is comfortable so that a rider can use a three-point seat. Um, well, and not just for the three-point seat because that gets thrown around and there's different variations of what people mean by three points. So what are your three points? The, the pubic bone and two seat bones. Okay, so now, you know, I have people come to me and say, I'm trying to ride in a three point seat, but I can't do what you're asking and be in a three point seat. So what's going on there? Well, without looking at everyone as an individual, it's hard to say, but um, there was uh, the lady, uh, Sylvia Locke, who rode classically um, and she was trying to teach somebody to ride a three-point seat and she actually phoned me up and told me this 
she was trying to teach somebody to ride a three point seat and the, the person kept on saying, I can't, I can't do it. You know, it's impossible. And in the end, Sylvia lost her sort of um, uh, mood with it. And she said, get off. And then she got on the saddle and then she couldn't ride a three point seat either <laughs> because the saddle was so the wrong shape to allow her to do that. So in other words, your pelvis is the shape of your pelvis. Mm -hmm. And the saddle then needs to meet you on three points. Mm -hmm. it needs not to be, you showed us like the, this one. Well, me, hang on, I can, I can, oops, I can remove spotlight. So you talked about this, right? Mm -hmm. So there it's gonna be too narrow. Yep. And there it's too wide. Yep. And so here's where I would get my three points because it would meet my pubic arch. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yep. And then- Yeah, it is. But it has to be, it's a lot kinder than that looks. Okay. Okay. It's a, it's a lot kinder. It's better shaped than that because right. that looks like you're sitting on, you know, a horse, a, a wooden horse, like, you know, right. uh, an exercise horse. Um, so the, the other thing is as well, if I just um, show you what I do to help that situation. Um, did I turn you around, Wind? Yeah, no. yeah, we're good. Oh, we're good. Okay. We're good. Um, if you think about it, uh, a tree is a little bit biased because it does that and then it swells to the side. We're looking down bird's eye view onto a tree now. Okay. Okay. It swells at the seat. And then you put your bellies on your seat and you make the shape right for the sit bones and then the bum. Oops. <laughs> it's got a smiley face. <laughs> so yeah. Happy bum. Yes, we're talking so, about the we're talking about the pummel shape to support the pubic bone. So in the idea yes. of a three-point seat, your two seat bones and your pubic arch are making contact. Okay. So if you think about it, what my point was was that some trees are biased because they've got all this at the back. And then they haven't got anything to hourglass this at the front like this and that's really where your thighs go in this is where the kindness comes in the three point seat situation okay yep so what i do and i'm just making a saddle for so the the fingers were simply to show that you have to match the shape of the pubic arch when we were yes. talking about that <laughs> Well, what I do, if I can get this, I don't know. Let me, Could you make your screen big for me again? Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Thanks. There you go. Okay, you should be good. No, you just got a pair of rabbit's ears. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, okay, I did make you big. Like you're big on my screen. Okay, well, I'm not on mine. I've, I've still got you on mine, but that's okay. Okay. Um, Let me just check anybody seeing Andy full screen. If not, let me know and then we'll try this again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, as you can see, what I do is I put skirt pads underneath the actual skirts themselves. So there's a pad under there that hourglasses the shape of the seat. So I can't see how much you can see. So it's a little bit awkward. But that hourglasses and mimics the shape of the seat. So that there's support for your thigh in this area here. It supports the front edge of your thigh. So that you, your thigh is actually taking weight as well as your crotch. So apparently if I speak, they don't see you anymore and I'm not sure why that is. That's why I've stayed silent there. Oh. Not sure how that happened. Um, okay. Yeah, he is supposed to be, hang on. Let me just see if I can unspotlight and re-spotlight. Hang on. Do, do, do. Uh, remove pin, let's see if we can get back to spotlight for everyone no i just want to spotlight him side by side so you're side by side right now okay now i'm going to make andy so i don't want to spotlight for everyone i just pinned him okay andy should be big now i don't know what he is on his screen 
No, I've still got you on my screen, Wind. Okay. Everybody else can see Andy full screen? Seems so. Okay. Just say that again. Okay. okay. Yeah. So what I what I do is I, I put skirt pads underneath the skirts of the saddle. And the, the skirt pad itself doesn't go underneath the leg. It's a shape um, that is in there and it wedges down like it tapers like a piece of cheese. And therefore it supports the front edge of the thigh and it hourglasses, it hourglasses the, the waist, the twist of the saddle. And it supports the front of the thigh. So the bellies are supporting the back edge of the thigh and the pads and the skirts are supporting the front edge. So all the weight isn't coming onto the crotch area. So you're not having to rely on just sitting on a on a four by two. You're actually um, being your weight is being taken in other areas, so that it's a kind contact rather than a point contact. Got it. Okay. Um, just go back to your screen, and I'm going to see if we still have a few things to talk about. So I'm going to see if we can get side by side going. Remove pin. If you want any help with that technology, you know when you know where to come. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I don't know why. Usually, all right. See, I, was, I wasn't using. I was just using pen, not spotlight, because I don't want everyone. All right. Are we back to side by side, folks? Just let me know. Um, and and just flip your camera around. And we'll just kind of recap the rider here because I think we've got it. All right. So um, one of the things that we didn't mention was the length of the rider's leg. And that's going to influence that seat bone to stirrup by relationship, right? It is. Yeah. Okay. okay. Do you want me to draw this? Because it's easier to draw it and explain it than it is to talk about it. Yes. Please go draw that. Okay. Okay, so we should still be side by side. And now I'm going to see if I can't make any big like I have done. So I do spotlight. What color do you want, Wynn? Oh, green looks good. Okay. And I'll keep quiet in case the screen's not sticking with you. Okay. So the question was what about longer legs? Am I right? Yep. Longer versus shorter. Okay. Well, obviously, if oh, I'm going to exaggerate things. This ride is very long in the calf and not very long in the thigh. See, normally, as we drew there, um, the flap would be coming down like this, and then do do do, like so. But I always treat the flap as a clock face. So you've got 12, 6, 3, 9. And depending, when I video the rider in the saddle, which is the demo saddle, um, I video them riding and I look at this as a clock face when I'm designing for them. And once I've got the stirrup bones and this, the, sorry, the stirrup bar and the seat bones decided, then because of this extra length, that's telling me that at half past eight, this particular rider is gonna need more room. So that comes into it like so. Um, and also, if they're long from there to there, they probably need more length. Otherwise, they can clip their boot on the bottom of the flap. So when you're designing it, you would add the length as well in there. And that way, they then get what they need also. But that length from there to there can sometimes mean and then they need a slightly longer seat uh, or slightly longer tree to center them correctly. 
because what you don't want to do is unbalance a rider by just putting all the difference out front. You also have to like rebalance the rider and recenter them so that they're still over their center. Got it. Okay. Now, um, thigh. now what, sorry? The short thighed person, the really short leg person. Use a different color. You can use a different color right on that board. By the time we've finished, I'll work this out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's just say. So the difference between that and that, if you, okay, imagine if you had a thigh block, let's just say their flap was there, designed there for them. And then we put a thigh block in there for the short legged rider. Can you see what's happening with a long legged rider? They're completely yeah. overriding. Not only are, are they overriding the flap completely, but they're also being hindered and overriding the thigh block as well. Um, so therefore, their thigh block for the long-legged rider would have to be there. So everything changes. And if you were to say which one, it would be easier, if you will, not perfect, but easier for the short rider to ride in the larger saddle, but not the long-legged rider in the small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it would still be a compromise, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th so we've kind of covered thigh blocks. In that they can either be helpful or really hindering. Well, the thing is as well with thigh blocks, the horse has a, a say in them as well, because, okay, let's, let's cut the horse through at the thigh block there and look at him end on. Okay, so if you've got a slab-sided thoroughbred, for example, your saddle comes over like so, and then your thigh block, looking at it from the front, if that's the panel there. It's a good job I can actually make silos better than I can draw them. Yep. <laughs> All right, none taken. You said so. it, I'm just confirming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So that is the thigh block looking from the front. So there isn't much horse here, and so therefore you can have a thigh. Don't forget, it's still gonna be the correct shape and position for the rider. We're now just talking of the depth of the thigh block. But because the horse isn't very far through from there to there, you can have a substantial thigh block there and it still feel right. Because rider's legs don't bend where the bone is. So therefore, if you put that knee into the horse, your ankle comes away from the horse at that point. But if you put a decent panel and thigh block in there, you can be on the horse and still be on the horse there because it turns your leg back and gives it support. You with me? Yep. So if you look at this from a different horse and let's say we've got a Frisian, like this, and there's a lot of horse through there, like that. When the saddle comes over, you don't really need extra width in the thigh block at this point to exaggerate what you've already got through there. So you can have less of a thigh block in the depth on a broad horse. Right, no, that's, that's really, that makes sense. Okay. 
All right, so let's see. I'm looking at your notes here. I'm glad you are winning. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to keep you on track. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we've talked about um, the pelvis, the rider's legs, the, the seat, the balance. Um, but I think in terms of the rider then, have we pretty much covered everything? Does anybody have any questions about fitting the rider that's watching? You can type it in the, in the Q&A. Okay. Um, I, I think we've covered it in as much as we've covered it in the most basic way. Um, yeah, that's that what there we're is basic. Yeah, it, it, this is very very basic. Yep. Um, there there is an awful lot more to it to think about than this, but uh, right. we, we've co covered it in a very basic way. So um, somebody's just checking that the thigh block is in front of the thigh and is not as much doesn't need to be as thick for a broader horse. Yeah, I mean, there's no need for it to be there on a, such a broader horse. You know, yes, people would want something, but you don't want a lot if you've already got the breadth in the horse. And so the thigh block you're talking about, that's that's in front of the thigh. Sometimes there's a block behind the thigh, right? Yeah, that's generally in a jumping saddle. And they're, average, well, depends, they're all over the place, but they, they can be like a block there, for example. And the idea was, to put the lower leg against it when they went into a jump. Right, and the purpose of the thigh block in front of the thigh, what someone's asking what the purpose of it is. It's if you've got a, an, a horse with a lot of impulsion and you do um, uh, sit in trot. Um, some horses ribs are so sprung that they act almost like a Citroen suspension and they, they can actually influence like this. And if you, they're so bouncy that if you haven't got something to brace into at this point, um, then, you know, you can come straight out the front door. Um, that's an exaggerated way of explaining it. Um, but in general, that's what it is. It's to come into uh, at that point. Um, for 90% of the time, you're probably not even touching it or using it. Right, I think that's a really good point to emphasize that the thigh block should not impede you in any way and should only be there in support at certain yes. moments. All, all saddles, the, the object of a good saddle is to ride it without knowing that it's there. Yeah. You should ride it and not have to think about it. Um, when it's designed correctly and, and it fits a horse correctly, then the last thing you should think about. You should almost feel like you're sitting bareback, but in balance. Um, because that way uh, you, you've got a nice maintained, a nice center balance, you're in balance with the horse. And I think a lot of riders, well, I don't think I know a lot of riders can be better riders than they think they are because they're actually on a daily basis. And I see this all the time, they're fighting this sort of thing. They're fighting their equipment where either the saddle's going forward and everything goes out of sync. And like I say, as soon as that happens, um, it, everything's wrong. Nothing can work right. The horse can't, the rider can't. But because, and it, it, a lot of people, it's not because um, a good saddle is expensive. You don't always get what you pay for anyway. Um, it, it's not that they don't want to spend the money it's that they, they don't understand that that is a problem and that is what's happening and causing, causing their sort of, you know, daily grievance um, that they can't ride properly. And can you define the difference between a knee roll and a thigh block? A knee, yeah, a, a knee roll is what it says. Um, and these generally were made on jumping saddles and remind me what we're talking about Wend I just want to explain the so seat okay um, re remind me of, I'll go to it the seat of a dressage saddle you have a nice central seat the seat different the seat of a jumping saddle has what we call 
a proper jumbo saddle, a broken twist like that, so that the rider can get up and forward to take the jump. They don't have this, okay? And then you have a cross country saddle, and the seat in that is shaped like that with a broken cantle and a broken twist. And that's because an inventor needs to be able to move from there to there. Because if they go down an Irish bank and they put their feet in the stirrups and lean back into the saddle, they need somewhere to lean back into to actually physically go into. Are you with me on that? Yep, totally. Okay, I've actually seen I've actually seen a rider in a saddle that was unsuitable for cross country and it was short, far too short. I've actually seen them come down a bank like this, push all the way back and go over the top of the cantle and sit on the horse. Sounds painful. <laughs> well, it looked peculiar, I tell you, but yeah. Um, so those are the seats. Now you asked me about knee, uh, knee rolls versus thigh blocks. Yep. So if, if that is a jumping seat, and let's just say, no, that's a, a dressage flap, stirrup bar there for dressage. For jumping, you want you to be over your center when you jump. So your stirrup bar is for, more forward. Use your green for the jump. Pardon? Use the green for the jump. Oh, okay. or, or some other color because the red's now the dressage. Okay. I'm going blue for the jump. Great. Okay. Uh, so, sorry. So the jumping bar is further forward than the dressage bar because when you jump, you need to be over your center. If you try jumping in a, a dressage bar that's way back, as soon as you leave the seat to jump, your lower leg is gonna flick at the back because you're gonna be two over top dead center. Right? Yep. So that's a dressage flat, roughly, dressage bar. That's a jumping, bar, uh, jumping bar. And uh, let's just make that into, ooh, make that into a jumping flap. And Don't forget, I'm drawing this side on as well, so I'm not quite You're doing great. At, not <laughs> quite looking at it myself. Um, a knee roll tended to be on the older jumping saddles, and they tended to do that and cup the knee with a sweat flap, and they cupped around the knee like that. And a thigh block simply is that it, it's a it's a block above the knee on the thigh. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So that's it, that's a thigh block and a knee, hang on. That's the thigh block. Mm. And all of that is a knee, knee roll. Oh, cool, that really helps. That's very clear. I like that purple color, it's really strong. I don't think I've got any purple. Yeah, I think you're colorblind. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, let's see. So, so shall I, can I just make a knee. suggestion? Oh, it's just some people are asking why there's suede on the knee on the on the flap on a jumping saddle. It's it's for preference. It's like purchase and grip. That's all it is. It's a yeah. preference. Um, some people I do with the inlaid seats are like the one you've just seen. And um, it's sort of softness and slight purchase, a slight, slight grip. Um, so uh, that, that's what it is, it's a preference. Some people are diehards and they just want a plain leather seat or plain leather flaps. Um, and majority of people want it with an inlay. Yeah, and some of them are padded, right? Yeah, you, you had your saddle all those years ago with no, flap, no pads at all. Right, right. Yeah. They're yeah. talking about the suede, the suede part of the flap 
Um, some and a jumping saddle. Sometimes it's got some padding in there, so your knee can sink into it a bit more, right? Yeah, and and we used to do one. Um, it, it happened because I, I went to a horse show at Babington, and there was a lady in front of me walking by the trade stands, and not only did she have blood, two blood spots on the back of her jumpers, where her seat bones had hit contacted the saddle, and it had actually pierced the skin, but also she had. Uh, raw uh, knees as well and so she was obviously riding in something like an old hunting saddle or something that was doing all this damage to her um, and so I made her a saddle and that was I, I used a, a, a what I call a breather pad and it was something that when she put her knees into it it was probably an inch and a half thick but very soft and it had breather holes in the back of it so that when she put her knees into it the pad actually formed almost around the knee and cushioned it. So there's all different things that you can do with that. Okay. So so somebody's asking, um, what is something that, they, and this is a great question, what is something they can do to, to evaluate their saddle fit? Because, you know, horses change summer to winter, they gain weight, they lose weight. So, you know, just fitting your saddle once isn't really the, you have to look at it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, and I, I think this, the, the two main things that I could, say for if you're like somebody that was didn't know what to look for in the first place the two main things are balance and horse's body language oh. because if a saddle goes out of balance either one way or the other um then obviously something's moved and changed um and if the horse's body language changes then you know there's something not quite right somewhere and they're the two most probably um you know uh, obvious signs that you could look for right um, and i mean i didn't really want to get into flock filled panels because there are good flock filled panels out there um, i don't use them um, because a flock filled panel hasn't got um a memory as such and over time it pads down so we're talking this, about like the flocking in the panel either wool or foam yeah okay. yeah and the thing is that if we look if we look at this, I don't know if you can actually I'll draw it on there. Let me just draw it because yep. it's it's, e it's easier. If you take the gullet, we're looking at it from a worm's eye view again. From a worm's eye view? Yeah, we're looking up at the bottom of the saddle. Oh. <laughs> where, where do you think worms live when? It's like I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so if this was a flock filled panel, um, and we talked earlier about horses that have, oops, <laughs> uh, horses that have a prominent shoulder and atrophied at the base of the shoulder there, and it makes their wither extremely keyhole shaped when you look at it from the end on, right? Yep. <laughs> Excuse me, it's my, my stomach's rumbling. It is. Eight o'clock and I haven't eaten, so I, I, okay. I'm sorry for the that. last thing and then we'll wrap it up. No, 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 it's, it's fine. I'm just apologizing for my noises. Um, so the thing that causes these hollows in a lot of horses is the fact that because the stirrup bar on, the, I'll do a different one. Show to that. Because the stirrup bar on a saddle tree generally, that's the point. Generally, and especially in jump saddles, is biased forward. And even if a dressage saddle has the stirrup bar in a good position, it's still not center. It can't be center of the saddle. So that means every time you mount or every time you rise in the saddle or every time you put weight in the saddle, the weight comes down through the stirrup bar. It's got to. And as soon as it comes down through the stirrup bar, and especially if it's a jump saddle, being so far forwards, what it tends to do is work against the shoulder and the weight comes down and the point and the saddle fall back into this atrophy, into this hollow. So if it's a flock filled panel, this is the area that's offending. And it's normally 
when it goes down in front, when I'm talking about watch, look out for the balance, if the saddle has been used and it's been flocked, the flock hasn't kept its memory, so it goes down in front. And most flock fill panels go down in front rather than anywhere else, simply because the stirrup bar is there and that's where the weight is. Are you with me so far? Yep. Okay. So when that happens, when the saddle is reflocked, and I'm not saying this in all cases, because there are good saddles that, saddle makers out there and saddlers that don't do this, but in my experience over all these years, a lot of uh, saddle, if you like, fitters, refitters, will just reflock that area and nothing else, because that's the area that's gone down. And then they create two balls that are harder than the rest of the panel. Then they put it back on the horse and yes, it's in balance now, but this area here is much denser and harder than the rest of the panel. So when the weight comes into it, the atrophied in the horse gets bull because you've got two balls pushing each side and down. Right. Um, add to that the fact that a lot of saddles haven't got the width in these areas. They're not broad. They haven't got this width. And they're much narrower and there isn't as much of them. Talking of your little close contact saddle yeah. earlier. Yeah. And so therefore this skin here, the more you put in it, the rounder it becomes at this point. So the more round and ball-like it becomes because it's narrow and captive at that side, this side, this side here, it's captive all round. So it can't go anywhere except expand upwards. And when it comes up, it goes round. And so that's where the, the atrophied and the problems arise in horses um, having the saddles reflocked um, just in that area. So you almost wind up compounding the problem in an attempt to solve the problem. Exactly, yeah. And that's exactly what happens. And that there are some cases where the, the more a saddle make, a saddle fitter, repairer, whatever, puts, puts in, they think that the more value they're giving you. And it's not always the case because as I said, in certain cases, this much makes a massive difference. Yeah, and the whole atrophy can start from so many different perspectives. <laughs> I mean, it can, it can, but it can be compounded so easy once it's started. Right. It really can. Um, and, and talking, the one thing that we haven't mentioned is the elbow of the horse. Um, and with the elbow of the horse, this comes into play mostly with girths. Um, but if that's the elbow, Let's talk big tummy again and the girth right behind the elbow. Um, if you have a saddle, oops, and a saddle on the horse. If you think about it, you've got to put the buckles, let's say dressage again, but you've got to put the buckles somewhere on the girth. Right? Yep. If the body of the horse isn't very big through there, in other words, if you had another horse and the body was much deeper, you've got room to put these buckles well away from your saddle, so you've still got adjustment, and they don't come near the elbow. But if you, and in some cases, the horse is quite short through the body there, then these buckles come low on a dressage girth especially, and they actually hinder and hit the elbow when the horse is in motion. So you can get the problem on the elbow simply because of the girth 
at that point. So what do you do there for that? Well, what you've got to do is, I mean, if it's so extreme, uh, the thing would be to use um, a contoured long girth and put the buckles up here to save the horse. So you just have as little there as you could get. Um, but in actual fact, a lot of times, nine times out of 10, you've got room to put the buckles as long as you put them higher than the elbow itself but you've still got room to put them. But what I'm saying is some people use a girth that is too short in the first place. Right. And there, therefore the buckles actually hinder and, and bang into the elbow. Right. So you want to make sure your short girth is long enough to clear the elbows. Yes. You want it long enough to clear the elbows and short enough to give you adjustment. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow, all right. Well, why don't you um, go back around the other side of your, your camera there and I will put us back in gallery view. And do, do, do. Uh, Andy, I, I didn't want to tell you that we've gone over two hours, but you probably knew. <laughs> I, I, I feel embarrassed. I feel embarrassed, but I think Master Mix just told us that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so um, let's see. So somebody's saying this has been incredibly informative and also entertaining. <laughs> but I do hope you two will you. be working on a stand-up routine for equine experts. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, we've been doing uh, that for a few years, I think. Yeah, we, we have actually done that, but not, not lately, but it doesn't take long to get back in the routine, does it? I know. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't believe 30 years. When I know. Wrong. It's it's that was at but, Max Gable in this place. You know, this this has been great, Andy, because you know the information is just simple and straightforward. And I think that's one of the things I love about the way you present is it's just the facts and you know only the well, facts. Well, thank you for that. I mean, as you know, it is easier if I can actually stand and face people and, and draw at the same time. This is a little bit awkward. And I I do not know how I've managed to miss all these leaks. <laughs> but it's worked anyway so but what i've got to do before if i have i finished drawing on there now yeah okay i can't go without signing off can i, I mean, come on <laughs> well you will be the first to sign off andy there we go wait you got to flip your camera around oh whoa 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 here, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Oh, how cute. Awesome. That's awesome. Well, thanks, yeah. Andy. It's, just, it's so fun to listen to you again. It brings back lots and lots of memories. And, uh, and I'm sure that everybody's Thanks, found this really informative. Well, that's good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And it's been good working with you, and Yep, it's awesome. And thank yeah. you, everybody, for tuning in. Just remember that you can find this and all the other webinars on the Sharefoot Equine YouTube channel. And on Friday, it will be our 200th webinar. And I will be there talking about how to use Surefoot in your daily routine. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a fabulous day. And thanks a lot, Andy. This is just, it's been so great to see you again. Thanks, friend. Yep. Take Bye care. Bye. Bye.